Greetings again, everybody. We're going to talk here about a category of disorders known as the seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Um, so there are three of them here that are really going to be high yield for your exam, um, and then one that may come up, but it's a little bit less common. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, but first, uh, if you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications as I put more and more videos up. All right, so the seronegative spondyloarthropathies are a diverse group of inflammatory disorders that tend to affect the joints. Um, they share in common some, uh, a variety of things. Uh, number one, they're RF negative. This is not rheumatoid arthritis, right? They do tend to have a predilection for the spine, some more than others, though. They also tend to involve the sacroiliac joint, um, again, some more than others. And then there is a correlation with the HLA-B27 genotype. However, not all patients with one of these seronegative spondyloarthropathies will have a positive HLA-B27, and certainly not all people with HLA-B27 genotype will go on to develop one of these. So it's just a correlation. It's not perfect. Um, so it's one of those things. You can test HLA-B27 and it lends credence to your diagnosis, but it's not diagnostic, unfortunately. There's a variety of uh, prevalences depending on geography and ethnic group. So in the United States, 8% of Caucasians will have um, the HLA-B27 genotype. Um, it is more common in Native Americans, a little bit less common in Hispanics, Blacks, and Asians. Um, in uh, northern Sweden and Finland, there's a group called the Sami. They have a prevalence that's been recorded up to 24%. These are people, an indigenous group that live in the very, very northern part of Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Okay, uh, so we're going to cover these four. These three are probably the highest yield. So we'll start uh, by taking a look at this spine. Do you see anything that's wrong with it? So these are the spinous processes here. That should say spinous. So those are the spinous processes. And then what we see here is the lower part of the lumbar spine and the sacrum. And what you can see is that you have fusion. You can also see, I think, okay, I'm going to show it to you here. Um, so you can see here on the left here, this is normal. Um, and so you see your spinous processes. And then here, this is uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Um, you can see that there's fusion here, and that fusion goes all the way down to the uh, sacrum. So this is also called bamboo spine, and it's called bamboo spine because of this fusion. Now, I also want to draw your attention here uh, to uh, in between the vertebral bones, uh, you have calcification of the annulus fibrosis. And that's another common finding. If you look back here, um, normally you see this kind of opaque appearance. Um, notice here how it's calcified. So this is distinct from most autoimmune diseases in that it's predominant in young men. And that's uh, something that makes these seronegative spondyloarthropathy stand out, uh, is that it's either an equal gender prevalence or more common in men. Uh, so we don't see that with lupus. We don't see that with RA. Most autoimmune disorders are more common in women. Um, but these seronegatives, uh, it's either equal or more common in young men. And ankylosing spondylitis is the best example. It's up to four times more prevalent in men. Now, with any of these rheumatic disorders that affect the joints, they tend to be worse in the morning and improve throughout the day. We see that in rheumatoid arthritis too. So that's a big hint. If you have joint pain that's worse in the morning, gets better as the day goes on with use, that is suggestive of an inflammatory, a rheumatic uh, joint process. On physical exam, one of the most salient features that you'll see is a loss of lumbar lordosis. That's one of the early physical exam findings aside from pain, and that's because of the fusion of the lumbar spinal processes. 
So to work this up, the best initial test is going to be a pelvic x-ray. I don't have a pelvic x-ray for you, uh, but what we're looking at, what we're looking for here is sacroiliitis, okay? So sacroiliitis is suggestive of ankylosing spondylitis, and you'll see it bilaterally. Go ahead and look up a picture of sacroiliitis. I would strongly suggest that. Further workup, HLA-B27 antigen and MRI. MRI is the most accurate test. So we don't start out with that, but... Um, that would be something that you would do if the uh, pelvic x-ray were equivocal. If you didn't see anything but you still strongly uh, suspect ankylosing spondylitis, that would be a really good next step. And if that comes back negative, then you would want to suspect other diagnoses. So this is what you would see on MRI. Our management here, the cornerstone is NSAIDs and physical therapy. So ibuprofen, refer to physical therapy, and then you want to get x-rays from the cervical spine all the way down because we want to establish a baseline. Okay, so we already looked at that. This is the loss of lumbar lordosis here. This is a normal lordosis of the lumbar spine, and then you lose that eventually with ankylosing spondylitis. So you can see that here, this is the same patient over the course of 25 years. You can see um, that he's lost that lordosis. It's right here. You obviously do not see it here. And then this is uh, an AP view. You can see the, again, that bamboo spine. All right, so we talked about this, NSAIDs and physical therapy. Uh, if it's refractory, you can use those TNF blocks or blockers like infliximab. This is a physical exam thing that you can do. I'm not going to go into it. Now, psoriatic arthritis um, is, uh, is also a uh, inflammatory joint disorder that's autoimmune in origin, but it's got some distinctive features here. Number one, 70% of these patients are going to have an established diagnosis of psoriasis. So look for on a vignette of a patient, a, a patient who um, has a history of psoriasis and now they have joint pain, okay? Uh, they may have these sausage-shaped digits. That's very common. It's called dactylitis. Uh, they often, like most, like a lot of psoriasis patients do, they can have nail involvement. A big one that helps you distinguish this from RA, because RA also tends to affect joints in the wrists and the hands, with psoriatic arthritis, they can have involvement of the distal interphalangeal joints, unlike RA, where it tends to spare those joints. And then they can also get enticitis, which is inflammation at the tendinous insertion sites. Okay, so you should know where those are. History, look for an established history of psoriasis, arthritis that's worse in the morning. And then uh, symptomatically, they can have that dactylitis, enticitis, and features of psoriasis. So you should know what that rash looks like, that kind of crusty, uh, keratinized, plaquey rash. Work up, you want to get an x-ray uh, of any joint that is affected. So here that typically means hands and fingers. That is the best initial test. Get a rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, to distinguish this from RA because of the similar presentation. HLA-B27 antigen. And if there is a big joint that uh, you can uh, check uh, the joint fluid, you can get an arthrocentesis with analysis. Problem is this tends to affect very small joints and often it's just not needed. Um, so again here, look for the DIP joints to be affected. So um, what you can see here is normal. Um, so notice these are your DIP joints here. And notice how you have a nice joint space there. Now compare that here, you see a collapse and erosion of the joint space. Okay, so here, 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 here. Uh, now, if you have enough erosion of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, bones in the fingers, um, it can affect any of them. Uh, but here, uh, you can see erosion, and it almost looks triangular. That's called the pencil and cup deformity, but this is a later finding. You can also see changes of the nails. Um, what I look for when I look for dactylitis is I look for a loss of these skin folds here. So here you can see normal, 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 and then you see a loss here. Likewise, this digit has dactylitis, this digit has dactylitis, this one kind of does, this probably doesn't. And then here you can see 
dactylitis in all five fingers. You see the psoriasis, the changes to the nails should be pretty straightforward for you. And then there's this criteria you can use. I don't, I do not recommend memorizing this, but it's always good to know sort of what we look for. So evidence of psoriasis, nail changes, a negative rheumatoid factor, dactylitis, and radiologic evidence. Best initial step is NSAIDs and physical therapy. Okay, same, basically the same treatment as we do for ankylosing spondylitis. In addition, though, you also have to manage the psoriasis, which is often with topical corticosteroids. Reactive arthritis used to be called Reiter syndrome. This is more acute. It comes on after an antecedent GI or genital urinary infection. As far as GI infections, look for the causes of bloody diarrhea, Campylobacter, Shigella, Salmonella. For GU pathogens, look for chlamydia. Big, big, big cause. Um, so look for that in the history. The symptoms is just this progressive asymmetric arthritis, but it tends to affect the lower extremity, so ankles, toes, and knees. Keratoderma blenerragicum is a fairly unique sign that you may see. We'll take a look at that. Constitutional features are common. So the mnemonic here is can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. So conjunctivitis and uveitis uh, may be seen. Conjunctivitis is more common. Uveitis is more severe. Urethritis, they may have a current urethritis or a, more commonly a history of urethritis. And then can't climb a tree, that's the arthritis and antacitis. This is keratoderma blenerragicum. You can treat this with steroids. So to work up, get a pelvic x-ray. Um, what you'll tend to see with uh, a reactive arthritis is... Um, a sac sacroiliitis that is often asymptomatic. Rheumatoid factor will be negative, and then you can see a variety of other findings. Definitely get a chlamydia DNA probe uh, because if that's positive, it's highly suggestive, although most of these patients are resolved. Um, so further workup, if they do have a positive chlamydia test, you need to check for all the other uh, STDs. So gonorrhea, HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis. That's always, not just with this. If, you got, if you're diagnosed with one STD, gotta check for all the other ones. So no single test is specific for reactive arthritis. Just look for the history and presentation. Best initial step here is NSAIDs. However, with this one, we tend to do NSAIDs, NSAIDs with rest rather than physical therapy. For refractory disease, you can use sulfasalazine. So management, I would do ibuprofen, uh, rest, and topical corticosteroids if there is a rash. And then the enteropathic arthropathy, this is also called IBD-associated arthritis or IBD-associated spondyloarthropathy. Uh, this can present in a variety of ways. So what I would look for here is a patient with established IBD, IBD especially that's not controlled well, or maybe they're presenting for the first time with diarrhea, weight loss, fever, um, in a young person, chronic diarrhea. Uh, the uh, treatment here is primarily just to manage the IBD. So methotrexate and anti-TNF drugs are fine. And then this is just a recap of everything we went over.